the uh, first part of the, the book, the first chapter that we've covered the last two weeks, talks initially about us as a healthy church and what the right perspective is for a healthy church. And last week we talked about a healthy church has ready leaders. And today we're going to be talking about that the, a healthy church has a redeemed family. But, so I don't know about you, in our house, we have on our refrigerator a chart of all the chores that all the kids in the house are supposed to do. Anybody else have that? So when, you know, we have four kids in the house right now. For a while, we had six kids in the house. For a while, we had seven kids in the house. It was crazy, and my wife couldn't do everything, even though we all wanted her to. So she made up this chore list that was right there, right on the fridge, because that's where everybody goes all the time, right? So you got to put it where everybody will see it. And it was very clear about whose job it is to do what on each day of the week. And it wasn't just a good reminder for that individual, but it was a good reminder for all the other kids because, like, no, that's not my chore today. See, your chore, you were supposed to do that yesterday, so I'm not going to do it today. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes, you know, holding each other accountable. But it, it was good to have that, and it's still good to have that up there, up front, in people's faces all the time, so the family runs properly, so it runs effectively, so it runs in a semi-healthy way, that people know what they're supposed to be doing, and they can do it, and then other people know what others are supposed to be doing, so that they can encourage them, or help them out, or be accountable, or when somebody misses a chore, that they can step in and fill the gap. You know, that happens a lot when our older kids, you know, they have this, but they're working jobs now, and so they kind of feel like they don't have to do their chores because they're making money. It's not like we're getting the money ourselves, but, but, but because that's there, other people in the family can sort of fill in the gap, understanding that this one family member can't do what they're supposed to be doing today. And the chapter that we're going to look at today at least the first 10 verses, are kind of like that chore chart. That this is one of those chapters and one of these sections of Scripture where it's like, this is what other people in the church should be doing. This is what we should be learning. This is so that both we know as individuals how we should be living for ourselves and then what we should know about other people and how they should be living so that we can hold each other accountable, so that we can be a healthy church. If we don't know what it is we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be living, then we're never going to be that healthy church, right? And sometimes I wonder if we, as a church family, recognize that we are a family and wonder if we know what we're supposed to be doing and wonder if we are even at the point where we're knowing so well that we're holding each other accountable to live and to do the things that God has called us to do. So it's always a good reminder for us to know that, that we at this church, at least at EBC, one of our callings and, and the way that we put it as, a, as sort of our mission statement is that we exist to honor God and to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Like, that's what we're supposed to be about. We need to know that. We need to hold each other to that. We need to be striving for that. And in so doing, there are certain ways that we are called to be living. Righteous and holy lives. Um, And and we're going to be looking at that uh, in just a few minutes at these first ten verses of chapter 2. But as we've been going through this uh, section, the key verses that we're trying to to put out there for us all to memorize and for all of us to learn are actually in the next section that we'll be going over in a couple weeks, but it's verses 11 through 14 of chapter 2. And we've been trying to encourage you all to, to learn and to memorize these verses. Has anybody been working on that? It's okay. It's all right. Um, well, 
Why don't we all for the moment stand up and we're going to read these verses together. And Drew, you may have to help me out because there we go. Oh, you like my, I, I spent a lot of time getting that transition to go really well. So. All right. All right, so let's read these verses together as a church, shall we? For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. All right, you may be seated. All right, so I saw a couple hands of people who have been working on trying to memorize it, which is good. Anybody willing to kind of come up here you know, <laughs> to say it? I have a $10 gift certificate to Coffee Hub for anybody who's willing to try. And I just said try. I didn't say you had to succeed. Anybody? All right. Nobody? No, Matt, you know? I, I also have a, a, a gift card for a free shoe shine at your shop. <laughs> so, you, probably, you probably don't need that. Yeah. All right, well. Oh, yay! Is this on, Stephen? Could you use this? All right, faith, yay. All right. That's okay. Yeah, so you might have been learning out of a different translation. Even Greg and I were like, like Greg, what version did you have up there last week? Because it didn't match mine. So anyway, say whatever translation you've been learning. Greek? <laughs> oh, hang on. It might not be on. It wasn't on. I'm sorry about that. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. While we wait. Or waiting for. Yeah. It's all right. You can look down and cheat if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> so different. That's good. You know, that is different. You did a great job. Lights giver. I'm proud of you. That's really good. Here, you can have it. Unless you want the shoe shine instead. No, no. Good. Thank you. That was pretty impressive. So. All right, well, that's an encouragement to me, and it should be an encouragement to all of us, that we can learn scripture, right? So, well, before we jump in, let's pray together and just ask God to bless our time. Father, we come before you this morning, grateful that we have a chance to be together as a body, Grateful for the reminder that we are a family as a church and that there are things that you have for us to do and ways that you have for us to live. And so I pray that you will teach us or remind us of these things today. God, your word says that scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so... I pray that as we look into your word, that those things would be true and present in what is said. That we would see your truths, that we would be reproved and corrected, and, and that we would be trained for this life that you have for us as your church, as your body. So... Yeah, God, may my words be your words. May all else be forgotten. 
And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we look at the nec- uh, this next section again. Like I said, we're going to do the first 10 verses. And I'm going to read those for us. And then we'll, we'll dive into it just a little bit. So t- Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their own husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Well, if you have your notes there in the back of the bulletin, um, there are some things in it that you can fill in the blanks, and I'm going to do something for you that certainly helps me out, is I'm going to tell you what all the blanks are to begin with. I know how frustrating it is sometimes when, you know, you have fill in the blanks and you don't know, what, or you missed one because you were either thinking about what was just said or you're daydreaming about something else, and so there's some blanks in there that you didn't get. So I'm going to tell you what all the blanks are in this. And then we're going to take the rest of our time to kind of fill those out, to unpack what those are. So so in their notes, the first one is that there, there, there's some three observations I'm going to make about our church family out of these 10 verses. And the first one is that our church family is intended to be all hands on deck. That's your first set of blanks, all hands on deck. That's the first observation. The second observation is that right thinking produces right living. And then the third one, which actually I have these up there so you don't even have to just hear me. All hands on deck. All right, Drew, just walk me through this and I'm not going to use this anymore, so I'll just... So the second one is right thinking produces right living. And then the third one there is right living gives us a credible platform to talk effectively. You have an extra blank that I have on the screen. But the right living gives us a credible platform to talk effectively to others about Jesus. Well, Drew, if you wouldn't mind scrolling through up there so they can see those other ones. If not, we'll just move ahead. All right, so did you get it? All hands on deck, right thinking, right living, credible platform, effectively others, Jesus. Those are all your blanks there in your notes. So... Now that we got those, let's unpack this a little bit. So verse 1 of chapter 2 says, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Uh, This verse is coming off of the heels of chapter 1, where Paul tells Titus that what the qualifications are that make up a healthy leader. And then he talks about the nature of false teachers And the kind of people that you actually don't want to be in leadership in the church. 
So after he talks about what a good leader looks like and what a bad leader is to be avoid, then he says, here you, Titus, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. I like the way that uh, the Living Bible translates this. It says, you, Titus, should speak up for the right living that goes along with true Christianity. So Titus' job was to talk about the right living that goes along with the right teaching. So both the passage here that we're looking at and a previous passage in verse 9 of chapter 1 talks about the importance of correct doctrine. And by the way, correct doctrine and correct behavior is something that Paul talks about frequently in his letters. For example, in his letter in 1 Timothy, he lists various sinful practices which are incompatible with sound doctrine. And so we're we're starting here, the very beginning, that teaching and lifestyle are intimately connected. Our beliefs and our life should be intimately connected. And so there, again, like I said, I love how it reads in the Living Bible where it says, speak up for the right living that goes along with true Christianity. But then he jumps in and is like, this is what right living will look like for each segment of the church. Verse 2, he addresses specifically the older men in the congregation. He says, teach the older men to be temperate worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. So Titus, most likely a younger man, the way that Timothy was, is to teach the older men. Which I'll say, that's sort of an intimidating thing for me. Like, You know, when I look to older men in our congregation, I think these are people who are older, they're wiser, they know things. If they do things wrong, you can give them a pass because they've had the experience to, you know, it's okay for them to mess up at times. But as a pastor in the church, like, it's my job not just to speak to the people that are in my life cycle and you know, my peer group, but it's to teach everybody in the congregation. And it's to teach older men. I think part of that is true because maturity doesn't always come with age, right? Sometimes older men still need to be taught things. And frankly, for me, there are a few things more perplexing than to see somebody from an older generation run around in an uncontrolled and undignified manner. It just doesn't seem to fit the right thing. Like, well, that's not how I expect a teenager to be doing that, but not an older person to be doing that. Well, at the same time, I think there are a few things more sad, in my opinion, than listening to an older gentleman who has sort of given up on life. Who, whose endurance has left them. You know, it's clear that from whatever circumstances that have gone in, on in their life that their sound faith has kind of been put by the wayside, put on the back burner many years ago and has just never been picked up again. And so because of that, they're unable to love or to forgive or to really go on living the life that God has called them to. But when Paul tells Timothy to teach older men, this here becomes a picture of what a mature man should look like. These people who are supposed to be pillars of our church, they're reliable and responsible men that you would turn to in a crisis or even just for a bit of advice. These are men who would never abandon their families They would never bully their coworkers or their employees, never abuse their wife or kids. These are men that you can count on. 
But sadly, we tend to downplay the importance of older men in our church, older men in our society. We downplay them like, oh, they had their time. You know, we're going to let this generation kind of go through. And, you know, they, you know, they did things the old way. We're going to do things the new way. And we kind of have a tendency to put the older generation aside. Now, if you watch any sitcom or watch TV in, in ways, you'll hear people mocking the so-called patriarchy. Masculinity, for sure, is in a crisis in our modern culture. And a large contributor to the crisis, unfortunately, if we are honest, is because of the men themselves. But Paul's prescription to Titus about this and his prescription everywhere else is to point men back toward the role that God has designed for them. And Paul's instruction here isn't solely for those men in the first century church. This is for men today, including us. It includes us. That older men in our church should be temperate. They should have the ability to control themselves, have clear, level-headed thinking. They need to be worthy of respect. They need to know how to control themselves. And those are the people that we can turn to because of their sound faith and their ability to love and their ability to have patience and endure to the end. So that's the first group that Paul talks about. The second group there is the older women. So Titus verse 2, or chapter 2 verse 3 says, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach that what is good. Then they can teach. We'll continue on in that in a second. But the older women should likewise live lives that are honoring to God. They should not be gossips or people who badmouth other people. Nor should they be addicted to alcohol or drugs. Instead, that they should teach the young women what is good. Older women, like older men, are seen by Paul as key components, key builders of our church, of our family. They are people that we look to. And the spiritual and emotional maturity that they have earned through their lives is seen as a benefit to be a gift to younger women. Without older women, half of the young people in our church would miss out on an important practical guide to just the complexities of life and faith. And so... Older women are to be, need to be taught these things as well. And again, it's because maturity doesn't always come with age. I, I do find it interesting that he says you need to teach them. Because some of these things we know or some of the things we figure out, but it just needs to be a reminder. So you got the older men that are supposed to be taught you got the older women that need to be taught. And then the third category in this is that there are younger women that need to be taught. In verses 4 and 5, it says, continuing on, that the older women then, that they can teach the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their own husbands. And I think this one deserves a little bit of special attention, especially because of the culture that we live in. This isn't one of those real popular verses in today's culture. But I think the first thing I want to point out to that about this is this, that older women 
are asked to teach younger women these various things. It's interesting to me that Paul doesn't ask Titus to teach the younger women himself. That he has the older women in the church do this. And I think it's true back 2,000 years ago as it is today that it's just not appropriate for a male pastor to be discipling young women. There's too much temptation in there. There's too much opportunity for something to look in a way that it shouldn't look. And so there's sort of an indirect teaching that a male pastor has to a young woman. But the direct teaching comes from woman to woman. And I'll say this too. We love as a church to make sure that we are including everybody in everything that we do. Like, but I think this passage as a whole, but this even specifically here, talks about the importance of having very targeted ministries within our church. That's why we have the women's ministry, the women's leadership council, who will take on this important role of helping to lead the discipleship of other women. That's why we have targeted children's ministries, and why we have other targeted men's ministries, that it's it's good and it's appropriate to have something specifically for somebody. But in general, we as a church do it inclusively. But that's why we have to know what each role is getting and what each role is supposed to be learning and know what our parts are. So you got the older women teaching the younger women. Um, but the other thing I want to point out about this and take a little bit more time on this is, is that though it really shouldn't be, it's pretty clear that a passage like this is a little bit more controversial in our current culture, right? You know, our Western culture has rapidly shifted toward this idea of regarding men and women as absolute equals. And the key word being absolute equals. Certainly, since both men and women are created as image bearers of their creator, there is some truth to this concept that there's equality there. We all stand before God on equal footing. We all have equal worth, equal value. We're equal sinners needing grace and mercy for salvation. And culturally, equal opportunities in society and politics and business and education in any other area, it is the right thing to do. But no matter what our culture says, there are distinct differences between husbands and wives and God's perfect design. You know, it's unpopular to say, but biblically, husbands are to be the head of the home. But is this absolute? Well, I wouldn't say so, in the sense that what about those husbands who have abandoned their family? And there's only the mom to take care of it. What about a husband who's incapable of leading their family due to a health problem like dementia or Alzheimer's or something else like that? There is a role and there is a place for our women to lead and to step up. But the role that God has designed is for men to be heads and for the women to be followers in that, to come alongside and to be helpers in that. Another way that men and women are different, again, in contrast to our current culture, is that biologically, only women can bear children and nurse children. We want to somehow make it out in our culture that that is different now. But, you know, as one commentator has been known to say, that facts don't care about your feelings, that there are true biological differences in there. That, and so it doesn't matter what the different voices are in our country that, that might say. In God's design, it is both natural and honorable 
for a wife to choose to be a good homemaker. And that is, in part, what Paul is getting at, that the older women can teach the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be taught to love their family. And I'm pretty sure it's probably true if you ask Emily that there are times that she needed to be taught to love me because it just doesn't come naturally. I'm not always that lovable. But to be taught how to care for her home, to be kind, and to learn how to follow their husband in that. So you have the the husband, or the older men, you have the older women, you have the younger women. And and before I transition on to the other one, I want to say this too, so that you don't mishear what I'm saying. This passage is not saying, and nor am I saying, that this is a young woman's only worth to be a homemaker or, or to be a mom and all that. Those are wonderfully great things that God has called to, but that is not the only place where they can find their worth. But it is special and unique and a strategic gift that God has given women. And this gift should not be neglected or made light of. The Bible certainly doesn't prohibit a wife from working or having an influential role outside the home. If you think about it, all throughout Scripture, there are highly capable and honored women who have done things outside of the home beyond just being a homemaker. If you think of Deborah, the judge back in the Old Testament. You think of the description of a wife in Proverbs 31. You think of Dorcas and Acts or Lydia or Priscilla or Phoebe. All of those are known for the way that they have served and lived and worked outside of their home. But it says here that they're to be submissive to their own husbands. And see, Christianity doesn't teach male dominance or the exploitation or suppression of women. Christianity teaches that there are roles and an order in which a relationship can thrive. So wives are to submit to their own husbands. No man has any right to lord themselves over any other woman just because, well, I'm a man and she's a woman. It it just doesn't work that way. And this is modeled in the Trinity where Jesus, though he is God and equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit in every way, he submitted to the Father in order to do what the Father wants. And so there are roles and there are designs that God has for us. And it is important for us as a church, and for the older women specifically, to be teaching our younger women how to live that way. How to love their families. How to control themselves and live pure lifestyles. How to care for a home. And how to even be subject to a person that may not be all that ideally suited for being listened to at times. All right, so let's move on to the next one. The young men, Titus verse 2, verse 6, says, similarly encourage the young men to be self-controlled. So after giving all these instructions to older men, older women, and young women, which, you know, for older men, depending on how you count it, there are four to six things that there are instructions in there. For the older women, I think there are four. For the younger women, there are five. For the young men, Paul has one single requirement, that they be self-controlled. And we can't even get that one. Yeah. And obviously, this is just a very ridiculous request, right? Because in our culture, we're showed everywhere that men can't control themselves. So why why should we even say this? Or maybe it's just that Paul knows that young men can only handle one thing at a time. You know, because we compartmentalize. 
right? So we can only focus on one thing, right? Now, seriously, I think the idea of self-control here probably could merit its own sermon and that there's so much that falls underneath what it means to be self-controlled. But suffice it to say that self-control does not mean being selfish and in control. It means that you're always following, or at least trying to follow God and his ways, because you're the one who's in charge of your emotions and desires with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so rather than them being in charge of you, you, by the grace of God, can be in charge of your own emotions and desires. But I think there's something else to this too, more than just this idea that he's only giving one thing. Because he says similarly here, so they're supposed to get all that other stuff as well. And I think Paul to Titus is just focusing on this fact of, let, let's just target in on this one because we know that this is a big one. And men really need to learn how to control themselves. But take it just a little bit further when you read the next couple of verses in 7 and 8. Because he turns the attention back to Titus for a moment. Where he says, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So the action verb there in verse 7, it's translated here, set them an example, literally means show them. Be a model of good works to men. Teach by showing. Young men will see and learn from the examples that they see. We don't always get the teaching, you know. Goes in one ear and out the other, right? But we will learn by the examples that we have. And young men need to see good examples put before them. This isn't a convicting one to me because I have young men in my house. And my young men has young friends. And they need to see in me, my son and his friends need to see in me what God needs me to do and what God needs them to do. And if they don't see it in me, they're not going to get it elsewhere. Because you know what? You're going to turn to YouTube and TikTok and everything else and get it wrong. So they don't need to see old men or middle-aged men sitting around playing video games and wasting their life away on video games. And I know too many middle-aged men who grew up playing Atari 2600 now think it's cool for them to sit around playing Xbox. Grow up. Because young men need to see you doing something worthwhile in your life. Young men don't need to hear stories from older men saying how they pulled one over on their wife or on their boss at one point in the, future, or in the past. They need to see men who are serious about life and about their faith. They need to hear men talk about how their faith intersects with their life and how they should live their life properly and appropriately. They need to see men who value hard work. They need to see men love their families. I'll be honest, I hate hearing believers swear and hearing them use the example, well, I'm just being authentic. Like, no, you're, you're being selfish. But when believers do that, when men do that, women too, but we're specifically talking about men. When men do that, 
our kids hear that and pick up and they just think that's appropriate. But that's not soundness of speech. And certainly this passage isn't just talking about your choice of words, and so don't hear me say that. It is talking about the truth and the validity of your words as well. But when all these things are in this, young men are watching and they're listening and they're paying attention and they're going to grow up to be men just like us. There have been times in my life where I'm like, yeah, I don't mind if my kid grows up to be like me. And I recognize that there have been times in my life where I'm like, gosh, I hope my son wasn't watching that today. So yeah, Paul is to teach young, or Titus is to teach young men to be self-controlled, but he's also supposed to be teaching by example. Because the young men are watching. And again, that's just as true then as it is today. So we got the old men, the older women, we got the younger women, now the younger men, and then the last category, depending on your translation, is either bond servants or slaves. And I forgot to mention that in between those two, you got the older men, younger, older women, younger women, younger men, and then Titus himself, the pastor, the leader, and then you have the bond servants or slaves. And I just want to make a note here that this is not a command for slavery, nor is it an endorsement of it. Certainly it's an acknowledgement of slavery within the culture. And I think sometimes it's a soft sell to say that, well, it's only to be talking about the employee-employer relationship, because that's not true. It is a slavery thing. And one of the great things about this is in its acknowledgement of slavery there, it is pointing out the fact that there was no difference socially between them, that you had slave and free on an equal level within the church, so something that was unique in society. And that how we, even today, would take that should be learning and understanding the fact that we should not be viewing people of different statuses in life in a different way, that the statuses should all be considered equal within our church family. And so while I do believe that this really is talking about slavery and not just an employee-employer relationship, since there is no equivalent of that in our current culture now, I'm going to address it as such, because that is the closest thing, is the category of, of an employee. So Paul is telling Titus to teach slaves to submit to their masters or their bosses. That, it's to, that they are to be pleasing, to not be argumentative, to not steal from their bosses, which, you know, in today's culture wouldn't be more than just stealing a pen or staplers and rubber bands and bringing them home. It was also stealing, like, you know, taking a sick day when you weren't really sick doing other things like that, taking away from your boss, or slacking off during your work day and stealing time from your boss. But Paul is saying that people in this category should have this integrity of behavior. And the purpose for this behavior is to be a good witness for Christ. The picture of this relationship between a Christian servant and their boss between a slave and their master, again, is one of which the Christian is not reluctant to do the work that they've called to do, but rather they're willing to do it, even joyful to do it, and to do what their boss asks of them. And when you think about it in that way, that makes this passage even more powerful when you think of the fact that he is talking to slaves here, 
is that the slaves should learn that they need to be willing, even joyful, to do what their master is asking them to do. And to do it with integrity. To not be a smart aleck and talk back. To not take what doesn't belong to them, even though you're the one doing the work for them. But they had to show that they, as a servant, as a slave, as an employee, is trustworthy. And even today, Christians should never try to exploit their bosses. But having an employee like this, well, isn't this every boss's dream? Wouldn't you, Matt, wouldn't you love if everybody at the shoe shop was this type of employee? Your mom. How is she? How is she? No. Anyway. If Christians were consistently like this, don't you think really that people would want to hire Christians? So this is what is supposed to be taught. Older men need to be taught things. Older women need to be taught things. These older women can teach younger women. These young men need to be taught things and be given good examples. And certainly... Slaves, servants, employer, employees need to be taught how to go about doing their stuff. All right, so let's go back to the three observations here. Now that we've seen what the passage says, let's go back to these three observations. The first one is that the church family is supposed to be all hands on deck. And there are three things I want to say about this. The first one is that everybody has a place within the family of God. It doesn't matter what your status is. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor or the leader, or you're a poor slave or servant, or whatever a societal status may be. If you are a believer in Jesus... You are a part of this family, and we need you in the game. Everybody has a place. Male, female, young, old, leader, servant. We need you in the game. Second thing is that everybody has something to learn. Old men with their age and experience still have something to learn. Older women still have something to learn. Doesn't matter if you've been a believer 50 years or 50 minutes, there are still things to learn and to grow in your faith. And then the third thing is that everybody has something to con contribute. We need you older women to teach the younger women. We need it. It's not optional. It's necessary. Don't be sitting on the sidelines because you're tired or you have grandkids or whatever. We need you in the church to be teaching and caring for the younger women. Maybe even babysitting for them because they're overwhelmed. I don't know. We need, we need the younger women to, to be learning to love their families and to care for their homes. We all know how well life is when our home is running smoothly and effectively. My house would be absolute chaos without my wife. We need the older men to be living a godly lifestyle, to be an example to the younger men. In many ways, we need the younger men to be stepping up and to becoming the leaders in the church. We need, everybody has something to contribute. 
even those who are marginalized in our society can be faithful in the position in which they are in. You don't have to have a particular role in order to have an effective ministry. Whatever position you are in, God can use you, and we need you to step into that role and allow God to use you. So all hands on deck. Second one is right thinking produces right living. It would be hypocrisy for us to say that we believe that God is true and that his word is true if we turn around and ignore how it tells us to live. Yet often that's what happens. We say, yes, I'm a Christian, I believe this. But then we go on with our lives as if what God has told us to do in his word doesn't apply to us. I mean, sometimes that's how... My kids are like, oh, you got rules, but those rules are for the other kids, right? I don't have to listen to that. I know I see my name on the chore list, but you can take me out of that equation and let somebody else fill in. No. Right thinking, and when I said this is our, our doctrine, we have right doctrine. It should lead to right living. We're hypocrites if we say that we trust God and then we disregard his word because it's hard or because it's not fitting with culture or not fitting with our common understanding of things. You know, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we're familiar with that, go and make disciples, Right? You're making disciples, that's the right teaching, right beliefs. But then it says, teaching them to obey, to do what, God, what Christ has commanded. So, you know, we don't go around observing people's doctrine statements, right? We don't say, oh, we, we can tell that they're a Christian because... They can pull out this, all this list of things that they say they believe. No, we tell people, they're, we can see that people are Christians because of their love, because we see their faithfulness to Jesus, because we see that they're obedient to the things of Scripture. So the right thinking is important, but it's important that it should lead to right living as well. And then the third one is that right living gives us a credible platform to talk to others about Jesus. And as I said before, there's a strong correlation between how we live out these principles and how others respond to or interact with the gospel itself. And to close, I want to look quickly at three so that phrases that are found in this passage that we kind of glossed over. But there are three examples of how we see that, that there's a correlation between our lifestyle and how people respond to the gospel. How that platform that we have when we live properly enables us to share with others. The first one is that, so that no one will malign the word of God. That's found in verse 5. If we have a, light, a right lifestyle, then we will not bring shame on the word of God. We don't want anyone looking down on the message of God because of our behavior. We can't let people criticize the teaching that God gave us because they're looking at us and saying that can't be true because that's not how that person lives. When our living doesn't match up to our beliefs or what we say we believe, then God's message will, could be brought to disgrace. And the word of God is dishonored in that. 
So the first, so that was in verse 5. The second one is found in verse 8. It says that, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, none of us want other people to say bad things about us, right? But if they do say bad things about us, it should be because they have to lie to make up some kind of story or falsehood that would make us look bad. And hopefully, if they had to lie, they would feel a bit of shame about lying. Nonetheless, unfortunately, Christians have a tendency to give unbelievers a lot of ammunition which they can use to shoot us down. If you think about it, what does the world think of Christians? You know, you can do those man-on-the-street interviews. What would people say about Christians? I'd venture to say that a lot of people would say that Christians are judgmental or legalistic or that we're hypocrites or that we're always fighting amongst ourselves and our denominations about who's right. They would say that why should I bother? The rate of divorce in the church is the same as the rate of divorce in the rest of the world. Those are terrible things that people say about Christians. Yet, do people feel shame about that? My guess is probably not, because it's true. Those things are true. And it would be so much better if we just lived out what we say we believe. If we were kind and gracious and forgiving. And so when people wanted to say th bad things about us, they couldn't find anything true that is bad. And so they would have to make it up. And the third thing, the third so that is at the end of verse 10 there. So that they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. When we live out our faith, it makes the gospel more attractive to those who have never heard or don't understand it. One translation actually says, they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Our faithful life decorates our beliefs. Our life makes our beliefs more beautiful, more winsome. And, you know, we all know this. In one sense, the gospel doesn't need adornment, right? It's good and it's beautiful all on its own. But in another sense, we show the beauty of the gospel in how we live in our godly lives. And when unbelievers see us consistently living out the Christian faith, it could lead them to say, there's something different about that person. And I want to be like them, or I want to find out more. So that's the church family. That's what we should be about. That's our chore list on the refrigerator. And we all fit on that chore list somewhere. We're all old men or getting there. We're all a young man or an old woman or a young woman. We all have a status that has something to give. So find out where you are on that chore list and live it out. That's what God has called us to do. So pray with me. Father, I pray that you'll help us live out these truths. God, thank you. I know that you're always teaching me and convicting me in these areas. And we want to be a church family who is faithful and consistent so that other people see you in us. And God, thank you that you forgive us where we fall short and that you use us in spite of our weaknesses. But God, we want you to be glorified in all things. And so I thank you for this church family and for your word and help us to live out these truths in the power of your spirit. Amen.